Thank you everybody for coming along today at a very uh, busy time of the academic year. Um, I'm really sorry that I'm not able to meet you all in person, but um, given the pandemic situation currently in the UK and possibly in Germany too, it's, it's maybe good that we're meeting online. I'll just say a little word of introduction about this, this paper, um, which I've written um, and, and I'm presenting for the first time, so I'll very much value your feedback. Um, this is um, uh, research that, based, this paper is based on research um, that I conducted with um, my Kyrgyz colleagues, Gulnara Aitpaeva, Nordan Choybekov, and Rahat Yusuvalieva in um, Lelek region in far western Kyrgyzstan. And um, in the paper, I'm trying to sort of bring together two conversations that I've been thinking about. One around the relationship between infrastructure and the ethnicization of social life, and the other um, conversations and debates about um, neighboring and about the sort of the, the, the art or the pragmatics of neighboring. Um, so the title sort of reflects these, these shared, um, this, this confluence of interests. And I'm trying to sort of really think across them through this material today. I'm gonna to read the paper um, in the interests of time and, and perhaps also of clarity. So here we go. In villages across rural Bakken region in southern Kyrgyzstan, the announcement that water has arrived, su geldi, has the potential to cut through conversation, interrupting whichever activity is taking place. Called out sing-song across garden walls, or passed on through children mobilized as messengers. The announcement signals that the recipient, oh, I'm just trying to find out how I can, here we go, change slide. Um, the announcement signals that the recipient should quickly muster hoses and pipes, spades and hoes, so as to be able to water, to irrigate their garden plot in the window allocated to their household. The water queue or orchid won't wait. As a burbling current fills the irrigation ditch or arak running around a domestic plot, improvised water stoppers made from tiles or crumpled cellophane are removed from holes in garden walls and reinserted downstream, allowing water to flow from the arak into the troughs and gullies of the garden, coaxed along by family members who remove obstacles and chase the water, as the local expression goes, towards vegetable plants and the base of apricot trees. Within a few minutes, the garden is flooded, the excess water poured into buckets and storage tanks or piped into rusting metal barrels. This work of chasing the water, su do, is intense and frenetic. The atmosphere can be playful for sure. On hot summer evenings, children delight the, in, the, in, in, in uh, the running water to hose each other as well as the plants. But securing enough water to irrigate a garden is also potentially shot through with challenge. Neighbors have to figure out fair usage on the fly. And a family felt to be hogging the water for too long before allowing it to flow further downstream will be chivied along across the wall between garden plots. The announcement of water can soon be followed by shouts across the wall of Shashkala, hurry up, from the next neighbor in the water queue. Families who live in parts of villages that are above the canal, Canal Asunda, at a height where water has to be forced mechanically to enter the Arak system, might receive water like this for just one hour every two weeks. In a dry year, this meager allocation can make the difference between a verdant and a modest summer harvest. Receiving a fair share of water depends upon a neighbor's timely warning to prepare for its arrival, the judicious monitoring of the Mirob or Su Bashchi, the head of the water in Tajik or Kyrgyz respectively, who regulates this household level water usage at a village level, and crucially, a degree of trust that upstream users further away are not illicitly diverting this precious shared resource into their own garden plots. When one part of this, of this delicate politico-economic and material infrastructure is interrupted, livelihoods can be imperiled as periods of intercommunal conflict have revealed. In Batken, as elsewhere in Central Asia, when tensions arise, it is often manifest first and foremost in the distribution of Arak water. This vignette provides an entry point for my reflections in this paper on infrastructural networks and the art of neighboring in rural Kyrgyzstan. 
The neighbor is something of an absent presence in anthropological commentary on the region, I think. There has, to be sure, been plenty of attention to the neighborhood, particularly in the form of the urban mahala, as a social and moral community premised upon simultaneous care for and control of its members. Writing of an Uzbek majority mahala in urban Osh, a city in southern Kyrgyzstan in the 1990s, for instance, Morgan Liu has described the network of arabs of water, uh, water channels linking mahalas with individual houses and urban apartment complexes in, in the city as evoking, as he puts it, a sensibility of communal responsibility. There's also been considerable ethnographic attention given to practices of informal collective labor premised upon the neighborhood as a territorial community of affection and obligation known variously across the region as Ashar or Hashar. In this ethical repertoire, Proximal residence obligates participation in acts of collective labor to clean ditches as here, cook for communal celebrations, whitewash school classrooms, or help with the construction of a neighbor's house. Within this model, good neighboring is recognized to be an ethical demand, as well as a mark of good citizenship. One celebrated in the saying common in Kyrgyzstani public life, that it's better to have a near neighbor than a distant kin. I want to suggest, though, that while the dense sociality of the urban neighborhood or mahala has been the subject of sustained ethnographic commentary, and while neighborliness as a discourse is often remarked upon as an emic value for regulating social life, neighboring as a complex, volatile and mediated social practice, one that might be shot through with tension as much as warm affection, has not received comparable attention in the anthropology of Central Asia. Nor perhaps is this just a case of the regional ethnography. The vast and comprehensive international encyclopedia, for instance, contains no entry for neighbor or neighboring. The implication perhaps being that unlike kinship or friendship, it is unworthy of theoretical attention in its own right. And yet as the neighboring vignette shows, neighboring is a complex, ambivalent and contingent art for the accommodation and negotiation of difference one that is mediated through resources such as water that may be unequally allocated, as well as through infrastructures such as pipes and canals that may connect unevenly or not at all. As such, neighboring is both unpredictable and deeply embodied. It's negotiated through physical and sensory extrusions of others into what might be marked as private space. It means being aware of and attentive to the sounds, smells, moods, and expectations of proximate others. It might entail on occasion, touching, holding, caressing, or kissing a neighbor who has lost a close relative, feeding a neighbor's child who has run into one's house to visit, massaging the aching joints of a friend who has helped to weave a carpet. It often entails sipping tea or laughing together over plov. It might entail hosting dozens of visiting outsiders for a neighbor's funeral, or conversely, maintaining a respectful distance on a crowded minibus or in a bustling market towards a member of the opposite sex who is not close kin. Neighboring, in other words, can entail distanciation as well as proximity, circumventing another person as much as reaching out towards them. It's precisely this ambivalence of the relation, I suggest, that makes it ethnographically and theoretically interesting. Most neighborly relations sit somewhere between the extremes of warm affection and cold hostility, and most have the capacity to oscillate between these extremes without the grounding appeal to shared blood or parentage or ancestors that can mediate conflict between kin. In the opening vignette, for instance, the quality of the re relation between neighbors is shaped by extraneous factors, the flow of water, the collective observance of the water timetable, the degree to which a mud wall between garden plots is poorly or well maintained, as much as it is by internal ones, such as the affection that one neighbor might feel toward another, or the memory of past help having been shared. As Martin Saxer and Zhuang Zhang note in a recent volume on making relations across China's borders, the neighbor is a complex figure that is both intimate and suspicious, a fact, as they put it, that renders neighboring 
an inherently paradoxical and unstable experience, one that needs constant negotiation, reinforcement, commitment, and performance of innocence and goodwill. If the neighbor remains an under-theorized relation, as Saxa and Zhang put it, <clears throat> there has been less, even less attention in the regional literature to what David Hennig, writing in a Bosnian context, has called metamorphoses of sociality after conflict. In rural Bosnia, wedged, as Hennig puts it, between post-war and post-socialist trajectories of societal change, these metamorphoses are characterized by the widespread perception that practices of interpolation and visiting have changed, that in a place dotted with empty houses, one now has to knock at a neighbor's door rather than being able to turn up uninvited. The lack of equivalent attention to what we might call post-conflict neighboring in rural Central Asia reflects, I think, a broader tendency in the regional scholarship to foreground moments of dramatic escalation of conflict and their immediate aftermath, rather than the longer term embodied labor through which relations are maintained at the micro level, even in, indeed, perhaps especially in, conditions characterized by resentment over uneven allocations of public goods between eth different ethnic groups, or durative pressures over making a life in crisis. So I'm going to um, try to uh, introduce now the, the field site where, this, um, where these, these ideas emerge. The primary research for this paper comes from field work that I conducted in Lalek district in 2015 and 16 as part of a collaborative ethnography on infrastructures of conviviality and contention in southern Kyrgyzstan. With my research partners, Gulnara Aitpaeva, Nurlan Trebekov and Rahat Yusubalieva, we conducted a total of 10 months of fieldwork in and across the spatially contiguous villages of Tajik majority Andarak and Kyrgyz majority Iskra, both part of Sumbala village district, Isle of Mutu, a district that includes two further Kyrgyz majority villages, Komuna and Kogtash. And you can see it here, the red, the red um, dot is, is the location of Andarak and Iskra. The black line you can see just to um, the west of those is the Kyrgyzstan-Tajikistan border. So we're talking here about the far west of Kyrgyzstan, the area marked in the smaller map in red. During that time, we conducted over a hundred interviews, the majority of them in the Kyrgyz language, with people of all ethnic backgrounds and a variety of social positionings. The nature of the research collaboration is such that the ideas and arguments that I present here emerge from our joint ethnography and the conversations in Bishkek that both preceded and postdated the fieldwork. I wish to acknowledge the role of that collaboration here, as well as the Wenigren Foundation for Anthropological Research for sponsoring the fieldwork. The motivation for this project in a village district characterized by recent memory of inter-ethnic conflict in the wake of the 2010 Osh events, when violence consumed the ethnically mixed cities of Osh and Jalalabad, was to examine peace and conflict potentials in Central Asia in a way that neither fetishized the communal sensibilities that might promote untamak or social harmony, nor presupposed that social relations across lines of ethnic or linguistic difference would necessarily tend towards antagonism or conflict, chapak in Kyrgyz. Our sense, and this was what sort of motivated the project, was that much of the policy and scholarly literature on inter-ethnic relations in Central Asia rested on a latent groupism that treated the given unit of analysis, whether clan, region, nation, ethnic group, or so on, as internally homogenous and naturally tending towards conflict with other such internally homogenous groups. These characterizations were at some remove from the complex practices for sharing social space and public goods, including sacred sites, markets, public transport, water pumps, and so on, that we had observed in our own prior work. Our approach to ethnicity was oblique rather than direct. We were interested, in other words, how and when ethnicity appeared or didn't as a salient line of vision and division in daily life. To do so, we adopted what we call an infrastructural approach. By this, I don't just mean a focus on infrastructure as a source or a driver of conflict, as much of the peace and conflict literature uh, assumes. 
Rather, drawing on Abdul Malik Simone's description of infrastructure as the in-between, the material and social connections, often mute, unremarkable and intransigent, which enable us to reach toward or withdraw from each other, as Simone puts it. We were interested in the habitual dynamics and material, technical and political systems through which local disputes are regulated, channeled or diffused. That is to say, how infrastructures themselves can constitute particular ethnically marked publics and how the allocation and distribution of resources in the context of struggles to get by and a deeply personalized state bureaucracy can magnify the experience of marginalization or ethnically based discrimination. The Sumwala village district, Ailak Matu, and specifically the contiguous villages of in Iskra and Andarak, with a combined population of around 6,000, provided an interesting place for thinking about these questions. The first thing to note about the village district of Sumbola is its relative geographical and territorial isolation, far from the capital Bishkek in the far west of Bakken Oblast, surrounded on all sides by mountains and non-distributive land, Ulush. This topographic isolation limits connectivity to villages that might be geographically close, but experientially remote. It also places considerable constraint on the physical expansion of the constituent, uh, constitutive villages as the population grows. People often spoke of theirs as the last village, the Akarka Isle in Kyrgyzstan, an expression that in Kyrgyz, like in English, pivots between a sense of both geographical remoteness and political marginality. And this was one of my informants pointing out um, Andarak in the context of Kyrgyzstan on a, school, on a school map. Viewed from the mountain road that sweeps up towards the village from the district center of Isfana, or indeed from the satellite view of Google Earth, it's impossible to tell where Iskra ends and Andarak begins. Both are remittance dependent and land poor, with small scale agriculture, livestock herding, and artisanal coal mining in the abandoned mine shafts of Sulukta, a few kilometers away, major sources of domestic livelihoods. The villages share pastures and woodland, a road, an administrative center, a police station, and a medical point, as well as infrastructures for the distribution of water, electricity, pensions, and welfare payments. There are limited opportunities for making a livelihood locally. With little agricultural land, as we can see here again from the Google Earth view, and few economic opportunities except as artisans, artisanal miners, or small-scale traders. It's possible to characterize the two villages as constituting a single social space, as indeed they did in Soviet times when they were part of the same collective farm. Hushbat Hojir, the Tajik political scientist, comments that Kyrgyz and Tajiks have lived side by side here for so long that it should be considered a single multi-ethnic community. And to be sure, there is plenty of talk locally about codependence, of drinking the same water and using the same road, of having grown together, and among Kyrgyz, speaking of our Tajiks as being different from those Tajiks in Tajikistan. Nonetheless, for all the performative force of such statements, both Kyrgyz and Tajik identifying villages typically speak of Andarak and Iskra as distinct social and moral communities and social life as de facto infrastructured along distinct ethnic and linguistic lines. Andarakski and Iskrinski, as they would characterize themselves and others, typically attend different weddings and life cycle ceremonies. They pray at different mosques and typically purchase from different village stalls and shops. Children attend different schools in the Tajik and Kyrgyz languages, respectively. Ethnic boundaries are maintained through strict practices of endogamy and highly circumscribed practices of age and gender marked socializing, typically based on the school cohort or age group. Ethnically mixed families are rare and are typically enumerated as exceptions that prove the rule that Kyrgyz and Tajiks here don't intermarry. Indeed, the last recorded example um, uh, was a couple who married in, in 1971, at least according to our informants. And the Ratsky and Iskrinsi are also differently connected with places beyond the immediate vicinity of the village district. While the Kyrgyz-speaking residents of Iskra 
maintain strong links with Bishkek and the Chui Valley in the north of Kyrgyzstan, where there are reportedly more people from Iskra than in the village itself. In Tajik speaking Andarak, by contrast, the primary social and cultural ties beyond the village are with Hujand in Tajikistan. While people from Iskra typically marry beyond the village, most Andaraksky give and take girls within the village, with cousin marriage common and many families living in large multi generational households, with the children of several married sons living under one roof. One consequence of this differential orientation to various outsides is that the Tajik population is significantly larger and more densely distributed than the Kyrgyz one, 1,100 families in Andarak compared to 526 in Iskra, though the two villages occupy a comparable geographical area. At 70,000 som per sotuk, about 1,000 euros at the time, land prices in Andarak for irrigated land in 2015 were almost as high as those in central Bishkek, a fact that has placed asymmetric pressures on land just beyond the village that is owned by the forest administration, the Lishoz. Both Kyrgyz and Tajiks experienced their predicament to be one of a marginal minority in the context of wider Kyrgyzstani politics. For Tajiks, that marginality is the product of their status as a numerically small, linguistically marginal, uh, and politically largely invisible ethnic minority in a vigorously nationalizing state. A community, moreover, that is ambivalently and only tangentially connected to the small number of politically active Tajiks in Bishkek. For the Kyrgyz living in Iskra, their experiential marginality derives instead from numerical inferiority within the village district, economic precarity, and comparative political insignificance within the, within the Kyrgyz nation state something quite different, as we were often told, from villages that were geographically at the border and therefore the target of a great deal of government and international assistance. In both Andarak and Iskra, daily life is characterized by a high level of existential insecurity, manifest by a widespread desire for exit, whether to Russia as migrant workers or to Bishkek and the Chui Valley for those from Iskra. The grounds for tension were also considerably exacerbated by um, physical factors. Both villages are irrigation dependent and liable to flooding when the spring meltwater rushes through the Sai, the large water channel that cuts through the middle of both villages. Both communities also depend on a single flood prone road to reach the wider world. In this context, neighboring, as our informants often stressed, was a delicate and complex art, oriented primarily towards the avoidance of conflict and the maintenance of a space of shared civility. I want now to turn to three dynamics that characterize the arts of neighboring in Andarak and Iskra. First, containing volatility through distancing. Second, asymmetrical accommodation through ritualized performances of respect. And third, the personalization of powerful others to secure access to limited public goods. I'll briefly explore each of these in turn before drawing some conclusions. So first, on containing volatility. In the last two years, social distancing has entered our vernacular lexicon in the context of pandemic response. We have all had to relearn our practices of occupying collective space, of queuing, greeting, taking public transport, and walking in crowded places. Interestingly and significantly, this space making is coded as a marker of respect and good citizenship. As the, office, as the door to my office building on the university campus reminds me, show respect, keep your distance. Daily life in Andarak and Iskra can be characterized as, sub, by, as subtended by practices of social and physical distancing oriented towards the avoidance of dispute, chatak, and the prevention of its escalation. Conflicts or top along are often spoken of as arising suddenly, unexpectedly, and apparently from nowhere, as had occurred in the winter of 2011, when a brawl between school children and recent returnees from Russia escalated, drawing in hundreds of male participants and resulting in considerable loss of property, with several shops and homes set on fire. Conflicts are perceived as particularly liable to escalate among village youth fostering wariness towards a number of externally funded initiatives 
of which there were many in the period immediately following this 2011 conflict, to foster more opportunities for contact among young people. By the time of our fieldwork, Andarak and Iskra had been the locus of a new youth club for peace, Zamir, funded through a grant from the UK Department for International Development, as well as a club for teaching martial arts, an incentive, uh, uh, an initiative of the Forum Theatre aimed at addressing social issues through drama, and even a UNICEF funded kindergarten, a building that was explicitly intended to provide a space of encounter and collective socialization among Kyrgyz and Tajik preschoolers. The logic of such initiatives, as with other international peace building uh, activities, was that encounter would foster tolerance, tolerantness, and here we see a, a hymn of tolerance, a gim tolerantnesti, which would in turn promote a durable peace. What we found by contrast was a considerable degree of wariness about such initiatives, a sense of not yet being ready for the kinds of relations such projects implied. By 2015, the UNICEF kindergarten had just three Tajik children regularly attending it and no Tajik employees. By 2018, Andarak had its own Tajik medium kindergarten, largely funded by the local community and a number of wealthy big men sponsors. Perhaps the most striking example of this separation of the public realm concerned the provision of an essential public service, that of share taxi rides between the village centre and the local town of Isfana. In the absence of a regular bus service, most families relied on this service to reach the local market, and indeed anywhere beyond. One had to go through Isfana to reach Bakken city, or indeed the city of Hujand in Tajikistan, the preferred destination among people from Andarak for larger purchases or gifts to bring to weddings and circumcision feasts. Taxis gathered at recognized spots or tochki at either end of the road that ran through Andarak and Iskra. For clients, the usual process was to choose one of the remaining available seats and to wait patiently or frustratedly, depending on mood, until four passengers had taken their place. A client in a great hurry might offer to pay for two seats or even the whole car in order for the driver to depart straight away. When I first learned that Kyrgyz and Tajiks from Iskra and Andarak used different taxis to reach Isfana town and even different departure points to return to the village after attending the local market, I read this as a sign of a certain kind of failure, a mark of hostility between communities scarred by the 2011 conflict, or perhaps a refusal to offer even a basic economic service, a taxi ride for a fixed fee to someone from the other ethnic group. After spending time in the villages, however, and chatting to multiple taxi drivers who covered this route, it was clear that the rationale for this ethnically demarcated space was rather different. Here, as elsewhere in Central Asia, taxi driving has come to afford a certain kind of social safety net, a job of last resort when other projects fail. In the absence of other stable income, it was one way for a young or older man, and here it was always men, to make 100 or 200 soms per day, a few euros, and in so doing, keep hunger from the door. In the autumn and winter of 2015 and 2016, this pressure was pronounced. Sanctions on Russia, combined with an increase in the number of deportations for violations of labor and residency registrations, meant that many men had returned unannounced and unexpectedly to Andarak and Iskra with a prohibition on re-entry to Russia, as Apretna Viezd. For those who could not secure work in the Sulukta mines, work which was itself fiercely guarded and dependent upon personal contacts, taxi driving provided a response to crisis, we were often told. With no regulation or licensing, anyone could park at the designated tochki and offer a ride, typically for a fixed fee of 50 soms for the 20 kilometer journey. As margins had decreased and numbers of hopeful drivers had increased, the informal rules of the game regulating how and in which order people left for the village had become pressured, with familiarity and friendship between driver and prospective client coming to trump the right order of departure according to, first, according to who was first in the taxi queue. Taxi ranks were spoken of as volatile places, 
Arguments could break out over who would sit where. Older people often assume that they have the right to sit in the front seat, for instance, even if they had turned up last, over whether the fee could be negotiated or not, and over whether a given passenger was keeping other clients waiting too long as they requested detours or drop-off points on the journey home. Add in bags, bumpy roads, and children liable to be car sick over fellow passengers, and the potential for offence or a bida among passengers or between passengers and driver was considerable. Moreover, I was often told, having separate taxi ranks would lessen the possibility that a Tajik man might be accused of having inappro acted inappropriately, albeit inadvertently, towards a Kyrgyz woman with whom he was crammed together in a vehicle, or vice versa, between Kyrgyz men and Tajik women. Precisely because Tajik rides three to a seat entail the intimate negotiation of physical space, such accusations, whether justified or not, were common and, concert, and could serve as triggers for the escalation of dispute. That was why I was told it was better that Kyrgyz and Tajiks had their own taxi ranks. As one driver put it, it was much easier for internal Ichki conflicts to be resolved than ones that might emerge between Kyrgyz and Tajiks, which had the potential it was perceived to consume and draw in a much broader and durative feeling of offence. Distancing then became a technique for the containment of social volatility, a locally developed mechanism for diffusing the perceived potential for conflict to erupt and, and consume social life. The second art of neighbouring that I consider, I gloss as asymmetrical accommodation through the studied performance of respect. And the Rakan Iskra are places characterized by a high level of social respect, typically denoted as urmat or hurmat, or having a thrimamile, literally having a respectful relation towards others. This was often spoken of as a virtue preserved in the district by dint of its remoteness and the enduring authority of older men. Sometimes it was explained in ethnic or regional terms as a characteristic of Tajiks in general or of Leilek Kyrgyz who had grown up in a multi-ethnic space. The importance of Ormat was identified in a variety of domains by our interlocutors and frequently commented upon. This included the ritualized aspect of everyday greetings and a distinct mixture of Kyrgyz and Tajik, particularly between younger and older men, in the modes of care shown towards parents and in-laws through the use of respectful sis or the throwing of large um, celebratory parties, such as in this case for one um, elderly veteran, or through the respect shown by a new kelin, a new bride, towards her in-laws during a marriage ceremony through an almost unending sequence of low bows. Respect had to be paid and given, and it required an audience for its efficacy. Rather like the maintenance of physical distance through separate taxi ranks, the everyday performance of age-based respect had the effect of sustaining a place of civility and diminishing the capacity for unanticipated offence or abida. Offers of tea or hospitality between neighbours, for instance, had to be refused gently, not with a direct no thanks, but with a kapabobongs, a request that the person offering not be offended by the invitee's lack of acceptance. Kapabobongs literally means please don't be, please don't be offended. The burden of this performance fell differently on men and women, on young and old, just as it fell asymmetrically on Tajik and Kyrgyz communities. As others have noted, the maintenance of Urmat was regulated most intensely through constraints on women's movement. Leaving a Tajik wedding with my friend's unmarried teenage daughter, for instance, we took a long detour through back streets so as to avoid walking home along the main road and therefore being the target of unwanted gazes or commentary. Concerns over respect or lack of respect acted as a particular obstacle to Tajik women's mobility and access to higher education in Kyrgyzstan. Women from Andarak, who might previously have been permitted to study in Tajikistan in the Tajik language, were de facto largely excluded from access to higher education, back in town and still more the cities of Osh and Bishkek, were seen as too far away and too lacking in familiar cultural reference to be considered safe places for our women to study, particularly in the wake of the 2010 OSH events. For those employed in state structures, such as members of the local government administration 
or teachers at the Andarak schools. This performance of respect extended to the signs, symbols, and political ideology of the Kyrgyz nation state. My Tajik interlocutors were acutely aware of living in a Kyrgyzstani nation state in which ethno-national sentiment was on the rise and, which knowledge, and in which knowledge of the Kyrgyz language was essential to be able to navigate the state bureaucracy and to get by. School leaders in Andarak took great pains to, it, great pains to ensure that children in this Tajik medium school were seen to be good citizens of Kyrgyzstan by participating in and receiving prizes in regional Olympiads focus on Kyrgyz history and civics, by reciting poems in the Kyrgyz language, or by demonstratively sporting kalpaks, a hat traditionally seen as a marker of Kyrgyz ethno-national identity on Kyrgyzstan's National Kalpak Day. Earlier this year, when violent conflict occurred on the Kyrgyzstan-Tajikistan border, at a significant distance from the villages, families from Andarak gathered money and household goods to distribute to displaced Kyrgyzstani citizens temporarily housed in Batken town, a fact that was widely publicized on social media as an index of good citizenship. Loyalty too was a mode of fragile neighboring that required an audience for its efficacy. The third and final technique that I want to consider can be glossed as the art of personalization, and in particular, the personalization of power. It has often been noted that in a context of weak rule of law and the uneven distribution of so-called administrative resources by those in positions of power in Kyrgyzstan, individuals become adept at pressurizing and mobilizing their tarnish bilish, literally their acquaintances, so as to secure jobs, information, contacts, and preferential deals. My final ethnographic example considers how this played out with regard to a crucial resource in the immediate vicinity of Andarak and Iskra, the state-owned Leshos forest lands. We've already seen how land shortages, particularly in Andarak, have created huge pressures around the sale and redistribution of land plots. Indeed, there is virtually no internal sale of land um, uh, in, in Andarak because um, pressures on resale are so, ex uh, are so intense. Most of the land immediately surrounding the villages is governed not by the village administration, the Isle of Mutu, but by the Les Hors, the forest administrative committee that's um, subordinate to the state agency for the protection of the environment. In the village district, that land amounts to more than 1,000 hectares. All of the Les Hors land is formally owned by the state, but a proportion of it, around 43 hectares in 2015, was leased, sometimes for relatively short periods and sometimes for much longer terms of several decades, for use as garden plots, mostly for cultivating tomatoes, onions, feed for cows, and the protein-rich legumes sein, uh, sein foin or espartset. Such leases are not intrinsically new. There was some leasing of less horse lands in Soviet times for long terms of use and for a notional fee. Crucially, however, Forest land was not treated as an economizable resource. The land was state owned and leases were not intended to generate a profit. This economic model changed dramatically in a context of restructuring of markets of land and property in the early and mid 1990s. Not only did forest land come to be seen as, a, as fungible, that is as an asset that could be turned into economic value, but the less horse itself was required by the state to become self-financing. This created both the demand and the incentive structure to rent out less horse land for cultivation, turning it from forest into cultivable land. Today, the majority of those who lease the less horse lands are ethnic Tajiks. According to our interlocutors, in 2015, 110 of the 120 families who leased this land were from Andarak rather than Iskra an index of the greater pressures on domestic garden plots in the village compared to Iskra. At the same time, the Les Hors is administratively a Kyrgyz dominated institution. In 2015, all but, all but one of the 31 employees of the Les Hors were ethnically Kyrgyz, and the chairman had been in place for two decades, creating established payments, uh, established channels of communication for informal access to land plots 
for those willing to pay the requisite fee outside the law. The perception among our interlocutors from Andarak was that while the hard physical labor of cultivating Leskos lands was undertaken by Tajiks, it was the Kyrgyz who held the cozy and potentially lucrative administrative posts that determined to whom land itself could be allocated. Among those from Iskra, by contrast, the perception was of the successive privatization of Leskos lands by Tajiks who illegally greased the palm of the Leskos director. The case of this forest, then I suggest, represents a clear case where the combination of economic incentives, the use of administrative resources, and the personalization of the state contributed to the progressive ethnicization of social life. For the land poor families of Andarak, accessing garden plots to secure a livelihood required making relations with the Leshos director through informal payments, gifts, and favors. Indeed, it was rumored that um, many of the Tajiks who, who rented this land were, in, were sort of privately employed by the Leshos director on construction projects. The effect, however, was, the de facto, was de facto to create the condition where Leshos lands was perceived as illegitimately distributed to Tajiks and de facto privatized at the expense of Kyrgyz herders, who now had to wend their way around these plots to reach their summer pastures and whose animals sometimes became trapped in the fences around these newly privatized plots. Okay, I'm gonna turn now to some conclusions from these ethnographic examples. I've sought in this paper to attend to the arts of neighboring in a context that we might describe as one of volatile conviviality. One that is where peaceful coexistence is understood to be a fragile achievement rather than a stable and durative backdrop against which conflict might suddenly happen. Studies of peace and conflict in Central Asia, I suggest, have not paid sufficient attention to this effortful labor of sustaining these domains of everyday peace. When peace as opposed to conflict has been the explicit focus of attention, the tendency has been to focus on overt public demonstrations of or exhortations towards harmony or untamak rather than the less visible performances of daily life through which differences among neighbors are negotiated or reconstituted after conflict. The rituals of respect through which people might greet each other on public transport, for instance, the practices of circumvention through which a tense space might be avoided, the proffering of hospitality and care at times of need, or the personalization of state power to access the materials essential to life. Writing of the labor of everyday peace in urban Karachi, Laura Ring describes peaceful coexistence against the backdrop of tense intercommunal relations as, quotes, the product of a creative, a relentless creative labor, less a rationally calculated series of diplomatic and strategic choices than it is a fully embodied campaign to interpret, manage, and regulate emotional life, both personal and collective, on a daily basis. The same is true, I believe, in Andarak and Iskra. But such inter interpretations in emotional management, as I've tried to show, do not occur in a vacuum. Rather, they are occurring in a context of uneven distribution of vital resources, of infrastructural precarity, and of legal indeterminacy. Any account of peace and conflict potentials needs to attend to the way that daily life becomes structured, indeed infrastructured, along lines of ethnicity, precisely because of such wider existential insecurities. Mine has been an emphatically local and specific story. My sense, however, is that while not representative in any straightforward sense, the dynamic of social relations in Andarak and Iskra premised upon a high degree of social segregation and distinct practices of accommodation, avoidance, and hierarchically articulated respect constitutes a form of neighboring characteristic of many ethnically mixed parts of southern Kyrgyzstan, where the central government is experienced as remote and, if anything, as an antagonizing or complicating presence in collective social life. This model deserves further analysis, I think, not least because it's distinctly different both from sites characterized by high levels of social conflict and from those characterized by high levels of inter-ethnic marriage and mixing, where ethnicity is a much less salient register of daily life. 
the ethnographic challenge it follows is to pay attention to the effortful work of keeping relations going in contexts of durable insecurity in the long aftertow of intercommunal violence without romanticizing or essentializing the neighbor or neighborhood as a space of necessarily warm and affectionate sociality. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to your questions.